dear friends, dear colleagues, thank you very much for joining us to this digitally enabled diabetes care symposium, how to make it a reality organized together by the European Diabetes Forum and the ATTD. European Diabetes Forum is a non-for-profit organization registered in Brussels in Belgium. And the major thing for European Diabetes Forum is to reimagine how diabetes care is delivered and work together to make its diagnosis, treatment, and management better. Members of the European Diabetes Forum include people with diabetes, healthcare professionals, and research organizations, including the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, the European uh, Fund for the Study of Diabetes, the Association of Diabetes Nurses, the FEND, the International Diabetes Federation Europe, the International Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes, the JDRF from the United States and all over the world, the Primary Care Diabetes Europe, a very important professional association to increase the reach of our, of our endeavor. And finally, the Société Francophone du Diabète, which again would reach those that are more fluent in the French language. We have supporting collaborators from pharma and medtech companies and also FPA and the medtech Europe. What we want to do together is bring all stakeholders to the same bottom line, align on priorities and urgencies, speak with one voice and achieve policy results that would directly benefit individuals with diabetes. And for this, we need an integrated and simplified approach. The European Diabetes Forum vision is to enable healthcare system first to cope with the diabetes pandemic while achieving the best possible outcomes for people with diabetes with a mission to ensure the translation of research into policy actions towards better diabetes care at the national level. So again, a direct benefit for the people with diabetes. The European Diabetes Forum prioritized to improve outcomes in diabetes care in Europe are, unlock the full potential of healthcare data, define, track, measure, improve outcomes in diabetes, rethink health systems, integrate care and empower primary care to be a more substantial actor in this very important healthcare network. And finally, empower people with diabetes, support self-management through digital technologies and innovative therapies. A particular focus here is on digital technologies because we all know that particularly in chronic diseases, they may actually offer interesting additional help to individuals that have to live with those chronic and many times non really treatable disorders. So today, digital technologies are driving changes in healthcare, as mentioned, and this is very diverse. So not only from the point of an individual with a chronic disease through apps, but of course, through the electronic medical records, electronic prescription system, telehealth solutions, and then of course, also on the level of the countries to better manage resources, to identify probably difficulties in the healthcare system and to basically improve the entire care. Digitally enabled care is particularly relevant for diabetes, which is a largely self-managed condition. At least we strive to be a self-managed condition that is also highly data-driven, particularly with the concentration and trends of glucose. Digital apps play an increasingly important role as the interface in between the person with diabetes and the digital ecosystem. And there are several hurdles, of course, for the greater use of these apps for the lesser attrition rate by individuals with diabetes and the healthcare professionals as well. So today, 
the digital enabled diabetes care, how to make it reality, will be discussed by Professor Peter Schwartz from the University of Dresden with recommendations on medical apps from the European Forum Self-Care Technology and Digitalization Workshop. And then we will have Digital Diabetes Solutions, the European Perspective presented by Marlene Loagui, the head of medical directorate from the Belgium M Health Pyramid, followed by Dr. Henk Wiese, a well-known diabetologist, medical director of the Diabeter, discussing digitally enabled care and the virtual clinic that he developed so nicely. Warmly invited to our symposium. Thank you very much today for the introduction. It's a great honor for me now to present the outcome of a strategic forum about digitalization from the European Diabetes Forum. What have we done in the last year? There were several experts from patient community, from European diabetes associations and organizations, but also uh, representatives from uh, lay groups and industry worked together and we tried to focus dedicated on the topic on digitalization and self-management. So it was a strategic forum putting together the evidence, but also trying to translate this evidence into practice and finally develop recommendation what the current evolvement of digitalization means for our patients, for their self-management, for policymaker, for for the healthcare community, but also healthcare professionals in the contact with the patient. So this was basically driving us. My conflict of interest as presented here, there's no conflict of rent interest related to the work of the strategic forum, digitalization and self-management of the European Diabetes Forum. What came out of this forum? And our goal was to write not another paper or to write another policy uh, product. We tried to put together the basic and practical evidence for the implementation of digital tools into the healthcare sector with a goal to meet the need of our patient with diabetes. So we wrote um, a policy recommendation booklet addressing different uh, kinds of stakeholders. On one side, it's the policymaker, then the patient community, the healthcare professionals, but also the developer communities and also the payer structures in the uh, healthcare sectors. And this is something very important to us. The main goal is to focus on uh, recommendations who are meeting the need of our patients. But one goal is also to push and motivate developers of digital tools to think in the same manner, to think in the same way, to develop tools to address the need of our patient with diabetes. So the structure of our policy recommendation booklet is an introduction explaining the role of digital apps in the healthcare sector, what policy challenges and objectives we have to address by embedding or implementing digital tools in the healthcare sector. And I'm not talking about apps with glucometers or um, AID systems. I'm talking about outtark working digital solutions. So a smartphone-based app helping the patient could control sugar, helping the patient for motivation, for physical activity, for uh, eating habits, and also to address um, comorbidities in the diabetes sector, for example, like depression. Then we explain uh, or try to arose what are the benefits of apps in diabetes care. And we give best practice examples from Germany with the DIGA sector and DIA Digital, Belgium with mHealth and France with ETAP. And finally, we translate this into policy recommendation. And in the next talk, we will hear one of these best practice examples from uh, Belgium. And this is something um, which uh, is different than a different approach than in Germany, but something which is very valuable to go ahead to implement uh, digital tools in the diabetes community. What are the recommendations? We have three groups of recommendations, how to develop a user-centered app, then how to develop a best practice access and pathways to this apps. It makes no sense to have a good digital solution, but there's no accessibility for the patient. 
So this will be the second group. And the third group is then uh, related to support the integration and uptake of high quality apps into the healthcare ecosystem. So our, our main understanding is there is a digital ecosystem for patients with diabetes. And we basically need a bouquet of different digital solutions to finally meet the individual need of each patient. And 20 different patients may have 20 different needs and need 20 different applications. So how to develop a user-centered design? Design and technical spe uh, specifications uh, written down, recommended, as is uh, written here, people with diabetes and healthcare uh, profession should include digital solutions in all stages in the development and uh, um, validation of the app. So they should be involved in developing these tools. It should be user-friendly, safe, and interoperable. This is a very um, uh, fast uh, coming aspect. If you use one app and you move to another app, there must be a way to take your data with you. But user-centered design also means what are the objectives and the features of the app. Yeah? So these features should be developed in a way to empower people for better self-management and finally better decision-making on the patient side. It should be personalized in a meaningful way so the patient should feel that this digital solution is supporting it, is coaching it, is helping him to go along with his uh, diabetes. And all the recommendations and what the apps are doing should be relevant and actionable. The second group of our recommendation, best practice access. So this was, our idea was best practice scale. If there is a good solution, what can we do? Or what can the community do to scale up this solution in the healthcare sector? So the, the, each member state should create a process how to license, how to validate, how to include and embed digital solution in the healthcare process. People with diabetes should be included into this process in uh, all stages. And we should think about evidence of these tools and not only hard outcome like, for example, A1C, if you are using an app, but also focusing on patient reported outcome and patient reported outcome measures in the validation of uh, these tools. Having a good accessibility, but no reimbursement can get generate a big barrier. That's why if the apps show that they have a real impact on the outcome of people with diabetes, there should be a reimbursement in the European uh, healthcare sectors. And the evaluation about the impact should not only be based on RCT trials, it should also be real world uh, evaluations um, using real world data showing the impact for the people on daily, uh, uh, including the apps in the daily habit um, for our diabetes patient. And finally, we would like to support the integration and uptake of high quality apps into the health ecosystem. So the apps who are proven, evident, having an impact in improving the outcome of uh, people with diabetes should become integral part of the patient pathways or the diabetes patient pathways in our uh, healthcare system. What does it need? We need to be trained to do it. Many healthcare professionals say, okay, no, I, I don't want to use an app from the app store for my patient, but we have to rethink if they are proven and validated, they should become part in the process of treating our patient. We should encourage the uptake and integration of apps into the healthcare pathways. We actually should encourage our patient, encourage healthcare provider to try it, to do it, to identify this patient who may have the most benefit of such a digital solution because he has good digital literacy. He has an affinity to use digital tools and this can then boost the outcome for this patient. And finally, integrating these apps, finally also in our guidelines, but before into treatment and care processes in the interconnection with healthcare professionals, in having an autark impact for our patients in improving their outcome uh, uh, of diabetes care. 
and in using this data generated by this app and feeding this data back into our um, treatment processes. So identifying better and better treatment on pharmacological part, on the lifestyle part, or the digital column for our patient with diabetes mellitus. And as you see, we tried to go deep into this field and to recommend what apps, how apps should be developed, how apps should generate evidence, and how apps should be included into the healthcare process for treating um, patients with diabetes in Europe. This was a big undertaking for this group of experts over the period of the last year. And that's why I have the great honor to thank all of the people who have been involved in uh, giving input, in discussing this. We discussed in several evenings back and forward how to recommend what is important, what is the main driver, um, how to assess the need of the patient. And finally, I think we can be proud to provide a practical document for developers, for policymakers, for payers, for healthcare professionals, but mainly for our patients, how to use digital solutions in improving self-management for our diabetes patient. Thank you very much for having this honor to steer this group. And we hope that best practice scale also means a scale up of this recommendation for the named stakeholder to provide, to provide and develop perfect digital solutions for our patients with diabetes. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Marlene Louwagie, head on the, of the Medical Directorate uh, of the Department of Healthcare at the National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance. And I will present you the Belgian framework uh, on uh, mobile medical applications. I have no uh, disclosures to announce. So I will give you a short overview of the steps that have led uh, to the creation of uh, the mHealth Belgium uh, platform. As a part of the eHealth roadmap, uh, we had uh, 24 pilot projects with mHealth apps that were selected and carried out in uh, 2017 uh, with financing of uh, the National Institute for uh, Health and Disability Insurance. And in uh, 2018, those pilots were evaluated. As a result, there was a clear need uh, for a framework for uh, medical uh, health apps in which quality, uh, privacy and evidence are key factors. And in order to integrate uh, valuable mHealth apps into the Belgian healthcare system and the reimbursement system, uh, the validation pyramid was uh, created. So the framework looks like a pyramid uh, with a lot of apps at uh, the bottom and uh, only a selected few at uh, the top. The level one uh, of or M1 uh, stands for CE certified medical devices that are notified at the Federal Agency uh, of Medicines and Health Products, providing a guarantee uh, for the quality, safety and efficacy uh, of uh, those mobile apps. And in order to receive the level one, uh, the company must also uh, declare to comply with uh, EU GDPR and uh, Belgian law. The level two is uh, the uh, level that deals with interoperability and uh, security and authentication uh, by uh, proving to meet the criteria of uh, risk assessment and all imposed criteria regarding authentication, security and use of uh, local e-health uh, services. Both uh, level one and two are uh, self-certifications by the companies. And then at the top uh, of the pyramid, uh, you have the M3 level, uh, which concerns the reimbursement, uh, and uh, that I will explain further in uh, the presentation. 
So uh, the Mobile Health Belgium platform is an initiative of uh, the Belgian federal government, but uh, the platform itself is managed by uh, BMedTech, uh, which is a federation of uh, industry of medical technologies, and uh, Agoria, the federation of technological uh, industry, and this in close uh, cooperation with three national uh, authorities, like uh, the, the federal agency for medicine and health products uh, responsible for the M1 level, the e-health platform responsible for level M2 criteria, and then uh, the National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance, uh, which is responsible for the reimbursement of the healthcare or the M3 uh, level. Um, on the website of MHEL Belgium, uh, the, at this moment there are 34 uh, apps uh, presented, like shown here in, on the slide. And in the right upper corner, uh, you can uh, see the number of the highest level that they have uh, reached. On the left side, you see that you can uh, filter on um, pathology, functions, users, uh, language, and uh, also the, the pyramid uh, level. And when you filter, for instance, on the pathology uh, diabetes, you get a selected uh, part of uh, the mobile apps on the website. And when you click on the app itself, you get a, a description and other information on the specific app. So uh, the reimbursement part then, um, there are uh, three uh, important uh, key elements in the reimbursement procedure. First of all, there's the care pathway. It must be well defined and uh, the reimbursement uh, will not be a direct reimbursement of the app in itself, but it will include a bundled payment uh, for the whole care. Um, it must be demand driven, uh, which means that uh, the need must be indicated by healthcare providers or uh, patients. And there must be an evidence added value and cost effectiveness. Unfortunately, uh, there is only uh, a very limited uh, evidence available for the use of uh, apps in uh, our medical care pathways. So, uh, for the definition, what's important uh, in, in, in the definition we use, use in Belgium for a me mobile medical application is the sharing uh, by the patient uh, of health-related information with his healthcare professional, and this from his own environment or his home. Um, and the healthcare professional uh, then uh, can uh, remotely diagnose or put in place a therapy or monitor a patient uh, via a medical device that is designed for use at home uh, with the patient. So I will explain now the framework for the reimbursement of medical uh, care uh, with the use of uh, medical apps. And in that framework, there are three uh, important parts. First of all, the notification, uh, afterwards the evaluation, and uh, the last part is the proposal uh, of the reimbursement. So the notification is the first step to be taken. Uh, a company whose apps are already in uh, meets the criteria of M1 and M2 um, for uh, this apps, he can fill in uh, a notification file, which includes uh, a detailed description of the functioning of the medical app, how it can be integrated in the uh, existing pathway, what are the benefits, uh, which evidence is already available, and what are the financial consequences uh, or the financial impact. And our file is available in Dutch and uh, French on our website. So uh, after the notification file has been sent uh, to our institution, we verify if it's complete, and then the file will be uh, discussed by the working group, including experts active in the field uh, of uh, the medical app. So the company is asked to explain uh, and to present his uh, 
app. Um, it, he explains the full functioning uh, of the app and how it can be used in an existing care pathway or in a new care pathway. And then the working group will evaluate uh, the file, also evaluate uh, the available evidence, and uh, they will decide if uh, they're interested in the use of this app and if it's uh, a valuable addition to actual care. And a, or a replacement of uh, existing care. When at this moment there is a negative uh, decision, uh, the procedure stops. If this is not the case, and uh, the the um, it's uh, evaluated as a valuable uh, product, uh, the care uh, pathway is identified and defined. Um, and uh, so a bundle payment will be. Uh, made uh, for um, this uh, kind of, of application used in a care pathway. Um, so there won't be a separate reimbursement of the application. It will be in the bundle payment of uh, the care itself. Um, we had um, in, in the past year, three applications that uh, were um, notified. And as a result of the discussion of those files, um, the healthcare professionals uh, want uh, a more integrated, uh, uh, um, a better integration of the useful data collected by the app uh, into the electronic medical record. And also they had uh, a lot of questions regarding uh, the privacy and, and, and uh, of uh, the medical data that's collected by uh, the companies. There's need uh, for more evidence. Um, and also our reimbursement criteria need to be aligned with uh, the care pathway in order to facilitate bundled payments. There's a need for a stakeholder meeting uh, in order to optimize information available on the mHealth Belgium website and also to adapt the criteria for M1, M2 and M3 to correspond to the demands of our stakeholders. So the next steps uh, we are taking uh, is a continuous evaluation and adjustment of the framework reimbursement. Also, um, Stakeholder meetings will help us to define uh, the needs uh, to adapt uh, the mHealth Belgium website and our framework. Um, we also asked uh, our knowledge center uh, to do uh, a study on digital health technology assessment to define uh, what is needed, uh, which process will be um, the best one to follow, uh, how health economic assessment uh, can be done for medical apps and so on. And uh, with all the, this information, we will uh, do the revision of our funding model. So I thank you for your attention. Welcome everyone. Thank you for having me about this talk about digital enabled care and virtual clinic. My name is Hank Face. I'm a pediatrician by training and founder of uh, Diabeter. First, my disclosures. Um, Diabeter was founded, but acquired by Medtronic but in a smart way that the clinic stays, the diabetes stays diabetes, um, with the freedom and independency of prescriptions. We work with everyone and the patient data are secure only at the diabetes side and not shared further down with the shareholder. And that is true in the regulations with the supervisory board, the client board, complaint board, and all the transparency requirements for the government. First one slide, slide on diabeter. Diabeter started in Rotterdam is number one. This is a picture of the Netherlands on the left. And uh, gradually it expanded um, because of uh, questions from clinicians to move to focused care or we sold for opportunities. Um, in the time we created, you see the lifespan from 2006 to 16, five clinics. We cover now close to 3,500 patients in the Netherlands and also expand to adult care. We are primarily focused on type one diabetes, but we also see uh, patients with cystic fibrosis, MODIs, and um, uh, also some insulin dependent type two patients. After the acquisition, and that was the purpose, we moved to other uh, locations as well. Uh, first was uh, Saudi, where we have an increasing uh, number of possibilities and clinics around 
and we have a setup in uh, Barcelona. Diabeter was recognized uh, on a number of occasions on the G20. Um, we won the, the value-based healthcare prize from Michael Porter, and we are one of the four example clinics for the World Economic Forum. Now we move from the regular care provision to thinking about how do we take care of all those patients? Can we do it smarter? We see the closed loop systems coming up. Uh, patients move to uh, a fair time in range uh, to HbA1c is 5.6, 5.8. Do you want to continue to see them four times a year? And if you only see them less often, how do you protect that things deteriorate? Um, how do you guide them? Uh, KLM Airlines doesn't send planes away and wait until they happen land on Lineta Airport in, uh, in Milan. Uh, they guide it by a system, a cloud system, which is called Eurocontrol. And we thought about, can we place such a system in place to guide our patients and um, keep them remote if possible, but get them in early if needed. And it went so well, and the experience with that, which we implemented in all our clinics, is so great that we also thought, can we expand it and offer it as a service to others in a smart collaboration? And uh, that is uh, where we're going to talk about now. So what is cloud care? Cloud care is a web-based brand agnostic management system. It's CE marked. Uh, it coaches the support of patients. The patients have an app which mirror subsets of the data, the important data, the heat map on the glucose movement, and they can communicate with the team. And the, the team is also very, has a high expertise on, let's say, the data aggregation. It's different from the care provision in the consultation room. It's more uh, different people like pilots are different from those watching in the watchtower on, uh, on Euro control for the planes. Um, on the next slide, all the, it, it is brand agnostic. So we deal with all the data we have set up and that is the complication. The complicated thing is we have set up different programs that all data from different systems of all current devices available and which we use um, merge to one system. And then you can make qualifications of the data with the standard thing like uh, the low blood glucose index, high index, standard deviations, time in range, uh, variance, uh, etc. And then according to that, we can do smart ranking. We can rank the patients, but we also can see trends within patients. And the purpose then is that on the basis of this outcome, uh, we can then decide um, given the trend or the exceptional uh, results in, in, in the bad direction, do we can we schedule an early appointment? And that is what we currently do in all the diabetes locations that we project um, next visits far away uh, if that seems likely to be safe but we can call them in more early or patients who really improve a lot, we can cancel their upcoming visits. It is not only the glucometrics, which is in the system. It also has the uh, essential clinical data, which you need, uh, obviously um, age, uh, but also the therapy path, um, the, the previous performance, the type of the diagnosis, and those items are really important to give you a clue on uh, what is happening. The offering with other clinics that on the right, we take care for um, with the other clinics to uh, be in contract to possibly reschedule um, the outpatient's visits or postpone a visit if, if, if that is okay. So you need a kind of arrangement uh, with the hospital to actually say, um, to agree on the, on the portfolio. 
and very much important as we experience, they want to have, let's say, we are happy to integrate data with hospital EMR. Obviously, not all data are important, but let's say the important uh, decision points, the, the summary on the glucometrics is, um, uh, we are happy to forward that to your system. You might um, choose today for this system. In the future, we may make some changes, improvements, or there is another competitor coming up uh, so that you don't want to lose your data. And that is very important. Or you are on an existing system and you want to move to this kind of guidance uh, system. It's important. It's not only the glucose data, which are there around in the, uh, in the competition, but it also makes smart combination with clinical data and arrangements with the uh, patient um, uh, care providers. So this was my talk about cloud care, uh, a new system which is currently being available uh, in all our clinics and also for a number of uh, customers which show interest to integrate that in their uh, hospital uh, EMR and their way of working. It altogether, it makes it more smart. Uh, the costs are relatively low compared to let's say the regular visits. And overall, the healthcare system can reduce the, um, the unnecessary spending of unnecessary visits and reallocate that money to more patients on closed loop systems, which at the end will uh, benefit uh, by reducing, let's say, the future complications and improving the life of the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much for all this presentation we just have here. It was very exciting to see at the beginning about the recommendation coming from EUDF and then the different presentations, how this already takes action in Europe, how this is already uh, going to be implemented and embedded into the European diabetes healthcare process. And it was very interesting to hear the Belgian examples presented from Marlene Lu IG. I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly. And this, uh, this session or this presentation from her uh, actually showed that it was very supportive to the first uh, EUDF recommendation, develop a user-centered uh, app. The goal was that uh, the apps develop focus on the need of the uh, um, patient and the technical specifications uh, she emphasized focuses mainly on interoperability and security. And uh, by this, it's also supportive for the second AUDF recommendation, develop a best practice access pathway for apps. So this Belgian pyramid is an intelligent system looking for digital solutions um, uh, addressing the need of the patient, but putting them into a kind of um, a digital ecosystem. And this example very nicely illustrates a structured way of labeling apps based on specific and transparent requirements. And this is what is needed uh, for our patient. The key elements, uh, what we have learned from here is first, the medical app and their place in the care pathway must be well defined. So it's not, uh, it could be an app um, having a label diabetes. There must be a specific place and best a specific gap in the healthcare profile filled by this app. And this must be known. Secondly, the reimbursement is demand driven. The need needs to come from the um, healthcare providers and people with diabetes. So not a kind of theoretical uh, development, it really must uh, uh, address a need of healthcare providers and patients. And finally, there is a need to demonstrate the evidence and added value and cost effectiveness. So that means in the process, this app should show what is the impact and how big is the impact. Finally, this was a very excellent illustration about the key objectives of EUDF recommendation, how they are embedded into a Belgian example, the Belgian validation pyramid, um, at the end coming to a close that those apps must be easily accessible, easily usable for people with diabetes and healthcare providers, and they should meet a very, very high standards. 
to show also safety for our patients with diabetes. So thank you very much for this very good Belgian pyramid validation example. And uh, thank you for the presentation, how the EUDF recommendations were embedded into this example. And by this, I will give the word to today. Thank you very much, Peter. Indeed, it was extremely exciting. And when we move, move one step further, we heard the lecture from Hank Wiese. What he showed is a system that's already embedded in the healthcare reimbursement in its full extent. And of course, it goes beyond a single app, although it does include apps that people with diabetes can use. So it's a system with a clear clinical pathway that has all the requirements that you just emphasized embedded in it, which is to the follow-up, the continuous follow-up that the, the, the data can be compared, can be analyzed. And of course, that the decisions that diabetes team takes are actually evidence-based. And the evidence comes from each individual person with diabetes, as well as the entire group. So this really points out our third recommendation of EUDF that we just presented, that you kindly presented in your, in your first lecture. So the system basically illustrates flexibility. So the allows that the care is accessed whenever it's needed because it's web-based and it's always available. The communication, it's a very nice connectivity between the healthcare professionals and people with diabetes. Empowerment, quite obviously, because people with diabetes can independently take the initiative and start the contact, which of course has a big meaning in compared to being called to do something. As I said, the data collection, analysis, longitudinal follow-up, and the decision-making based on this data and the analysis of the data. And of course, also the healthcare efficiency, because all these parameters of quality control can be followed up and of course can be matched with the resources that were spent on all this and perhaps compared to other systems, just to show that the efficacy as well as the cost benefit of this web-based system actually permanently exists throughout the development of this clinic. So it looks like that this presentation of Hank is very supportive of our recommendation to integrate and uptake high quality apps into a health ecosystem, which in the, in the case of diabetes already exist. So what do you think if we go next, how will the people with diabetes look on all these systems, Peter? Digital solution can be very supportive in initiating, maintaining, and also uh, gaining motivations for people to start, to stay on, and to sustain a good self-management um, as patient with diabetes. But the key at the end again is, it must be part of the classical standard healthcare pathways and the voice of the patient must be heard from us as or from healthcare providers and diabetes teams in maybe a different way, in a louder way, in a more uh, collaborative way in the future if we think about modern digitally supported kinds of diabetes care. So thank you very much for this presentation. Um, it was an honor for me to participate. It was an honor to hear all the different examples. And I think working for one year in EUDF to put all this recommendation uh, together, today we have seen already a small little um, uh, seed in a fertile soil how these recommendations can grow to finally provide good digital solutions for our patient with diabetes. By this, I give it to back to you today. Thank you very much, Peter. Indeed, also thanks from my side. First to you for your excellent presentation, Peter, on our recommendations. The first recommendation, develop a user-centered app the second recommendation, develop a best practice access pathway 
for this app. And the third recommendation that this is actually part of the high quality healthcare ecosystem. And allow me to thank all three presenters, actually four, first you, Peter, and then Marlene Logie from Belgium, who is a governmental official in the reimbursement system in Belgium, a very crucial perspective from her side. And to our colleague, Hank Wiese, presenting the diabetes system, which is already a reimbursed and fully embedded into the ecosystem reality and a very important example for our recommendations. And with this also, my sincere thanks to Bart, who is behind all this and is helping us and supporting the initiatives of EUDF. Thank you also to all of you who stayed with us for this symposium for the ATTD EUDF 2022 symposium online here from Barcelona. Sincere thanks and warmest regards.